else remembers those awesome Animorph covers from the 90s and early 2000s? You know, the ones with the kids morphing into lizards and bears and aliens. A lot of times they had a cutout window where the animal's face was, uh, and when you opened the paperback cover, there was a glossy full-page illustration of what the animal was doing. For example, book one has a boy transforming into a lizard, and inside you see the lizard is inside a school locker. Oh, oh, and in the bottom corner of all these pages inside it, there were flip book images showing the boy to lizard process. Today, let's take a walk down memory lane and remember Animorphs, as well as some of its sister series. This is the children's episode. Warning, I read the Animorphs books when I was really young, like in middle school, but I don't know what every parent wants their kid reading or listening to. These books are about war. If your child will be disturbed by discussions about weapons and death, this might not be the episode for them. Thanks. Hello, Earthlings and Spacelings. Welcome to the Fantagy Podcast, your portal into science fiction and fantasy books you'll probably never read. Too weird, too old, or too weird as a movie. Together, we'll investigate original works of prospective fiction. I'm your host, Erica Brickley, Follow me on Instagram, subscribe to the YouTube channel, click the share button to copy the link, ring the bell. (sighs) You know the drill. Sorry that the upload schedule has been so unpredictable. I've been job hunting back on Earth, and it's been hard to motivate myself to work on episode scripts. So I should say, welcome back. For those of you who are new to this podcast, web series, audio message in a bottle, I try to cover lesser known fantasy and science fiction books that follow a pattern. It goes like this. One episode is an obscure title that I feel is underrated. The next is a classic story due to its author or acclaim or age. Then we switch gears to the really weird episode where I pick out a book whose cover really gets a what on earth is that kind of reaction. And finally, we choose a story designed for children or young adults that I feel comfortable uploading to YouTube and checking the yes, this video is for kids button. Much as I loved the Scholastic book series Animorphs by Catherine Applegate and Michael Grant under the name K.A. Applegate and several ghostwriters, I've only read a handful of the series. Between 1996 and 2001, Applegate wrote 54 volumes, each with their own title and narrator. There was also a companion set of books, subtitled Megamorphs, that added a little more depth to the characters' lives, plus two game-style books called Alternamorphs, and four prequel-slash-parallel novels about non-human characters. There was also a cheesy live-action TV series in 1998 that lasted two seasons. And as of 2020, there's a graphic novel series. In case any listeners haven't had the chance to discover the world of Animorphs, I will introduce the main premise. I will need to spoil the events of Volume 1, The Invasion, so if you think you would be interested in reading the series, I would hold off on listening to anything about it until you've read that one. For those who don't mind, here we go. A ragtag group of teenagers take a shortcut through a construction area one night and come across a spaceship, out of which comes a badly injured alien, Prince Elfangor. We'll return to his species, the Andalites, in a minute. He explains through telepathy that the evil Yurks are on their way to conquer Earth. They are a parasite race that will climb into a person's ear, take over their brain, and turn them into a controller. Nearly impossible to distinguish from other humans. Elfangor says that the Andalite fleet won't make it here for at least a year, and someone must defend the planet in the meantime. So he gives the teenagers the ability to morph into animals whose DNA they've absorbed, a powerful piece of Andalite military technology. Soon after, a sadistic yerk called Visser III, the only one to have acquired an Andalite body host, arrives to kill Alfangor while the teenagers hide. From there, the adventure kicks off as they begin to find controllers amongst the members of the community, police officers, teachers, siblings. The teens find out where the secret yerk pool is hidden under the school, since the parasites need to exit their hosts periodically to rehydrate. They get their first taste of a rescue mission, but in the process, one of their members becomes stuck in the form of a red hawk, since you need to leave your morph every two hours or it becomes permanent. Thus begins their involvement in the war against the Yurk Empire and the fight to save Earth from being enslaved. 
even though I loved book one as a tween, I didn't get fully invested in Animorphs. I think I read books 1, 2, 7, 27? I kind of skipped ahead to covers I liked. The original covers, with the kids morphing into animals, were done by David B. Mattingly. While Mattingly is a fantastic painter, the Animorph covers were a little goofy sometimes, <laughs> very computer generated. I mean, they got the job done. Those books sold like hotcakes. I've just never been good at sticking with really long series. My friends and family love One Piece, Naruto, Black Butler, and so on, but I can never keep up. <laughs> and those are just examples of comic books, not even full-scale written novels. Out of sheer curiosity, I read volume 54 of Animorphs to see how the war ended, but I won't completely spoil the series for everybody. So, what part of this massive collection of works are we going to talk about today? Well, I want to focus on my favorite books from the series, the spin-off prequels. As I mentioned earlier, there is the main Animorphs series, and there are several adjacent novels. Four of them take place completely separate from the events experienced by the human teenagers, Jake, Rachel, Cassie, Marco, and Tobias. For me, these are the real stars of the show. Although, again, I have to fess up to not having read all of them. <laughs> These include The Andalite Chronicles, The Hork Bajira Chronicles, Visser, and The Elemist Chronicles. I only have the first two, not having acquired or read Visser or The Elemist Chronicles. You might be wondering, is there any point in reading these prequel books without having read Animorphs? Well, much as it helps to know some key things about Animorphs to piece together some references, these books are largely standalone with minimal spoilers. And if you're like me, unable to slog through 54 volumes even if the series is super great, that's good enough. More than that, these books take place in outer space. Animorphs is a series about humans. The Andalite Chronicles and the others are about aliens. I want aliens! <laughs> I want far-off worlds and new cultures and strange forms. The K.A. Applegate aliens are so interesting, too, so I love having whole books told from their perspectives. At first, I plan to cover the first one, The Andalite Chronicles. It tells the story of Elfangor, Elfanger, El Elfangor, starting from when he was still new to the military, many years before the Yerk War arrived on Earth. The preview line on the cover is, Before the Animorphs. There was El Fangor. And I still might summarize it someday because it's awesome, but it's also well known within the right circles. Wouldn't it be interesting to go back even farther to when the war really got going? The hork Chronicles is that story, with the prologue taking place after volume 22 of Animorphs. Back in ye olden days, before every kid had a pocket computer, I did some of my best reading by stumbling across cool things in used bookstores. I found Animorphs at the library, I bought the Andalite Chronicles at a book sale, and I blundered into the hork Chronicles at some random bookshop in Kansas City. Don't ask me where, it was like 15 years ago and I barely understood the geography of the place. Seeing that cover hit me like a ton of bricks. It took me only a second to realize that I was looking at an unknown book about Andalites. I was very familiar with how Andalites look because Elfangor, Elfanger, Elfangor, the one who gave the Animorphs their powers in Volume 1, is featured front and center on his book's cover by Romas Kukalis. As Kukalis paints them, based on David Mattingly's renditions, Andalites resemble centaurs with a humanoid upper body and horse-like legs and hindquarters, complete with four hooved feet. They're covered in short blue fur and have a long tail tipped with a curved blade. Notably, Andalites have two eye stalks on top of their heads for a total of four eyes and no mouth because they're telepathic. Kukal has painted Elfangor with a chin but a detailed bat-like nose in place of lips. The Andalite Chronicles came out in 1997 while the Animorphs series was ongoing. So it's hard to say whether David Mattingly or Romas Kukalis came up with the design elements they both used. Book 8, The Alien, has an Andalite on the cover who shares all of Elfangor's characteristics, including tail blade shape, muscle patterns, pointed ears, and nose configuration. Whatever the case, they both capture the very alien yet endearing appearance of the Andalites. Applegate did a great job of creating something that is at once so different from a human, yet just familiar enough that a bunch of teens wouldn't immediately run off screaming. 
For any of you who have read the series and believe Mattingly and Kukalis' paintings don't quite match the original Andalite description by Applegate, we'll circle back around to that after the summary. Don't you worry. Returning to the book at hand, it's one of my favorite sci-fi covers. Romas Kukalis did such a beautiful job of making these alien creatures look real and alive. The hork Chronicles was published in 1998, just a year after the Andalite Chronicles, but it seems like Kukalis really put a lot of effort into this cover. On the front is a shoulder-up portrait of two alien people. On the right, a beautiful Andalite with purple fur and a feminine slenderness and facial build. Her eye stalks twist up over her bald head to glare at the audience, matching the challenging look in her golden eyes. Her ears are very elfin, reminiscent of the Elf Quest books, and her complex nose is brown, almost canine, but with a pointed tip so it's kind of teardrop shaped. On the left, there is a taller, more imposing figure, completely different. Built of sinewy muscle under speckled olive green skin, this creature has a bright green beak of a nose and three forward curving green horns in a line from the top of its head to its forehead. Its red eyes stare challengingly at you. It is a little reptilian, a little bird-like. This creature and the Andalite stand in front of a purple and blue background, the blue casting shimmering light across the Andalite's pretty shoulders, catching in her purple fur. Flipping the book over, you're met with a much larger landscape. The two characters from the front are shown in full, standing on a frighteningly steep piece of land overlooking a vast place of giant trees and canyon cliffs. The treetops tower above, and the trunks disappear into blue mist below. The Andalite looks out at the world, delicate in her centaur body compared to the great green reptile. Her long, monkey-like tail holds the curved blade at its tip at a safe distance. The green alien is all muscle and spikes. Its neck curves snake-like, and it clings to the steep red ground with bird-like talons on multi-jointed legs. Its own long tail is also tipped with green blades. Seeming to show the Andalite this world, it holds out its huge clawed hand, putting the four arm blades on full display. Here and there, its skin is decorated with bright green spots. The green alien has three fingers and a thumb, while the Andalite has six fingers and a thumb. In my opinion, Kukalis probably based his original illustrations of the Andalites on Mattingly's work, because Elfangor on the cover of The Andalite Chronicles looks just like the computer-generated images from Animorphs, while there are differences on the cover of the hork Chronicles. The main differences are the nose and the tail blade. Elfungor's nose is the same color as his face, blue with pink skin showing through, and oval with pronounced breathing slits. This new purple Andalite's nose is, as I described, more brown and animalistic. As for tail blades, Elfungor's tail ends in a sort of ribbed rattlesnake shape where the vicious curving blade attaches to it, very round and sharp like a fish hook. Meanwhile, the purple Andalite's tail ends in a tuft of hair, not unlike a lion or a donkey, uh, beside which a thicker scythe-like blade is attached. It seems like Kukalis had a, a little more freedom with his cover and made edits based on how he perceived the Andalites to look. She reminds me of the delicate paintings of The Last Unicorn from the book by Peter S. Beagle. As you read through the hork Chronicles, you are greeted with the classic Animorphs flipbook images along the bottom of the pages. This one features a yerk slug turning into an ape, evolving up into a hork morphing into an Andalite, and finally settling into a human boy. That doesn't make much sense when you haven't read the story yet, but I wanted to mention it. My hardback cover makes it a little harder to flip through anyway. It was always better with the paperbacks. The Andalite Chronicles is especially great since it features spaceships zipping around planets and black holes. Enough of this. I've talked long enough. I just wanted to give you some idea of how cool these covers are before we jumped into the plot summary. Ready, set, go! Prologue Tobias is one of the Animorphs, the five kids who were given shape-changing powers by the dying Andalite prince. But he's different. He lost his human form when he stayed in the shape of a red hawk for too long. Sometimes he just flies, and sometimes he finds himself flying towards the hidden valley of freed Horkbajir. 
These are frightening-looking alien creatures who were enslaved by the Yerks during the war, who were then liberated and brought here. Quote, There were razor-sharp blades at its ankles, knees, wrists, and elbows. There were two long, forward-raked horns coming from its head. It had a tail that ended in stegosaurus spikes. Unquote. The first hork bajir Tobias sees while flying in is actually a child, only about four feet tall. hork bajir don't live as long as humans, so they grow up faster too. He remembers when this one was born, after he helped their parents, Jara Hami and Ket Halpak, escape here. Now there are a dozen or so residents in the Hidden Valley. Tobias watches the creatures carefully strip bark from trees and build family campfires. Tobias joins Jara, the hork bajir he knows best, and the creature smiles with its terrifying face. They are simple people, happy in their simple lives, the complete opposite of the empirical parasitical yurks who used their species as shock troops. Eat bark, Jara offers. Good bark. Being a hawk, Tobias politely refuses, speaking via the telepathy granted to him through alien technology. He settles in, since tonight they will tell stories. What stories could such childlike people have to tell? Tobias isn't sure. Story of Father Deep. Story of Mother Sky. Jara says. Story of Yurks and Andalites. In his slow, easy speech, Jara talks about his grandfather, who was a seer. To the hork a seer is a person born with exceptional intelligence akin to humans, and his story was passed down. Jara closes his eyes and rocks in the firelight, remembering. Then he tells the story through a mix of languages, and Tobias's mind drifts as the story takes him far away. Quote, An Andalite female named Aldria, a Yurk named Esplin, the hork bajir Dak Hammy. Unquote. Tobias fluffs his feathers and settles in. Chapter 1 Andalite date, year 8561.2. Yerk date, generation 685, mid-cycle. hork date, early warm. Earth date, 1966. Aldria Iskillian Fallon is an Andalite female who would one day be famous, perhaps infamous, but started out as a normal young person. She overhears a thought-speak conversation between a warrior, Alaran Scimitar Karas, and Prince Ciro. It has happened, Aloran says angrily. As I warned you, it would. The prince is stunned, in disbelief, as Aloran produces a cylindrical holographic recorder. He plays it, and it shows a 3D picture of aliens called the Ged carrying primitive weapons, though one has a dangerous Andalite shredder gun. The Ged advance on Andalites guarding their ship and fire upon them killing two in blinding fire while the others are swarmed. Prince Ciro is devastated, hardly able to stay standing on his four legs. This prince is Aldria's father, and it pains her to see him like that. Meanwhile, Aloran is still going off on him, disgusted that the prince trusted the promises of parasites, for the Ged are infested by Yurk slugs. He doesn't care that the Ged make good symbiotic hosts. You can't trust parasites. Aloran has reason to be upset. His warriors were butchered by 400 Ged attackers, like the one in the hologram, and now the Yerks have control of spaceships. Aldria feels sorry for him as she listens to the horrors. Now there are four fighter ships and two transport ships loaded with 400 Yerk controlled Geds somewhere out there, since they took off into zero space and could be anywhere now. Just then, news comes that the Yerks actually made a stop on the other side of the planet before leaving loading a quarter of a million slugs from the Yurk pools into the captured ships. A quarter million? Prince Zero gasps. But, but the Yurk leaders, they have been my friends. They cannot know about this. The Council of Thirteen must not have known. This is some rebellion, some group of malcontents. You fool, Aloran says, daring to speak disrespectfully to his commanding officer. He admonishes the prince for trusting parasites and showing them the universe, going so far as to help them build portable Kendrona rays that mimic the nourishing light of the Yerk sun. Prince Ciro tried to help a fellow sentient race, but instead unleashed a plague on the galaxy. Prince Ciro, you are relieved of duty. 
You can't relieve me. When a commander has become incapacitated due to injury or mental defect, his subordinates may relieve him. What mental defect? Stupidity. The stupidity of kindness. Charity to potential enemies. You're a fool, Zero. A soft, sentimental, well-meaning fool. And now my men are dead, and the Yerks are loose in the galaxy. How many will die before we can bring this contagion under control? How many will die for Ciro's kindness? Aldria has a bad feeling that this is how her father will be remembered. For Ciro's kindness, a sarcastic reference to the terrible mistake he made in helping the Yerks reach the stars. Unable to listen anymore, Aldria runs outside. They are on the Yerk homeworld now, where the only changes in scenery are the Yerk pools that look like molten lead. It's a dreary world with a green and yellow streaked sky and nightly acid rains. Andalites don't like to be indoors, but here they have to build shelters against the rain. Now the failed Andalite Yerk Peace and Cooperation Center. Chapter 2 Andalite Date Year 8563.5 Yerk Date Generation 686 Early Cycle Orc Bajir Date Late Cool Earth Date 1968 Aldria struggles to fit in with her female peers, who generally become scientists and artists. She wants to be a warrior, to fight Yerks. However, female Andalites have smaller tail blades better suited to surgery than battle. And that continues to shape the path of the sexes despite advancements in modern warfare. She wants to use shredders, to use the new morphing technology, but her parents won't listen. Some years have passed since Aldria witnessed her father's greatest failure, already labeled Ciro's kindness by society as they prepare for war with the Yerks. Ciro now does as he's told, doing whatever puny jobs he's given. Now, he and his family are being sent to another planet, and Aldria looks down at it from the spaceship. The world looks dead, made out of dark, cold rock, wrapped in a thin atmosphere, aside from cracks around the equator, as if someone stepped on a melon until the sides split. The steep valleys in these cracks, nearly 50 miles deep, have rich air and greenery until you reach the poisonous gas at the bottom that glows at night. Aldria's little brother Barafin comes to fetch her. It's time to board the surface ship. They agree that the planet is strange looking. We'll be okay, Aldria says. Yeah, I guess if this planet were dangerous, they wouldn't have sent father, Barafin says. Aldria agrees privately. They've both been bullied a lot at school for their father's failings, and now he's never given any real responsibility anymore. After two months on the ship, she and Barafin go to find out what their father's new job will be like as the only Andalites on the entire planet. On the smaller ship, they descend from the planet's surface into one of the cracks. Trees huge beyond belief grow here on the steep sides of the valley. The smallest at least 200 feet tall, and the largest 2,000 feet. Their trunks are hundreds of feet around. The ground is nearly vertical in places, nearly parallel with the trees. Aldria's mother, a biologist, is quite pleased. These are record-breaking sizes. They land in a clearing that's almost flat, and the gear is unloaded. Aldria takes her first steps on planet RG215784, fourth in the solar system from its red giant sun. It turns out the family isn't completely alone. There is a sentient race of people here, but they don't build cities or roads. They are scary-looking, but harmless herbivores. Not especially bright, I'm afraid, Ciro says, trying to sound upbeat. No culture to speak of, no written language, no music, as far as we know. They don't build much, if anything, and they are technologically the equivalent of a primordial civilization. It becomes clear that Prince Ciro is here because no one expects the Yerks to be interested in this backwater planet. The crew unloading the family's gear are all aware of it. At least the grass tastes okay. Barafin says, digging his hoof into the blue-green grass. Aldria isn't pleased with the place. The huge trees, the terrifying slope into the blue mist. She's only somewhat interested in the local sentient species, called hork until one comes out from around the nearest tree. Chapter 3 Dak Hammy is a hork 
but he is different. His mother knew when he was small that he was strange, and all the elders agree and are disturbed. They said that Dak was a seer. A seer is one who is born to show a new way, says the old one. Many, many seasons pass. Then our father, the deep, and our mother, the sky, says, send a seer to the people. The people have need. And so one is born who is different. It's not easy being different, being a seer who is supposed to show a new way. The old one says that the deep and the sky will tell him. And until then, he must wait and put up with being different. He has thoughts no one else has. What's in the deep? How high is the sky? And does strange things, like draw with bits of ash. He draws rocks, trees, the Jubba Jubba monsters of the deep, and even his friends. This is you, Jaggle, he says. That is not me, Jaggle replies. I am me. I am here. I am not there. I am not a scraping by a burned stick. Then one day, Dak saw something come down from the sky and he knows the time has come to find out why he is different. So he follows the sky thing and sees creatures. Quote, They had four legs. One, two, three, four. They had a tail, but it was high, not dragging on the ground. They had two arms. They had no blades, except one small blade on each of their tails. Their horns were very small, and they moved. And there were eyes on the ends of their horns. They were not horns. Horns do not have eyes. They had no mouths. Unquote. Dak Hammy introduces himself and is startled by the voice in his head, replying, I am Prince Zero. The thought voices speculate that the young hork is in a similar stage of life as the prince's children, and one steps forward to meet him. My name is Aldria, she says. We are Andalites. We would like to be your friends. Finally, Dak knows why he is different. Chapter 4 Dak immediately reports back to the elders. This is why Dak Hammy was born, they say. This is why Father Deep and Mother Sky have sent us a seer. Dak Hammy must watch and speak. Then he must show us the way. So, Dak returns to where the creatures live. Only four remain, living in a space dug out of the valley wall. He watches them retreat inside when it rains, or run in the grass when the sun shines. He puzzles over the many things they own. Eventually, he brings his friend Jaggle to go meet and observe the newcomers on the ground, since they can't climb. The newcomers talk a lot in their thought speak, though only Aldria, the one from before, really speaks directly to Jack and Jaggle. They seem to be having trouble understanding Dak the way he understands them, and Aldria has him tell her about the nearest stula tree. So, he explains where the best bark is, when it's best to harvest it, and other truths taught by the old one. Got it, one of the Andalites says, and it seems that whatever magical translator they have has picked up enough language to be useful. The four young people stand there and try talking, though Jaggle is quite nervous. Dak wants to know where the Andalite's tribe tree is, and Aldria says it's on another planet, though he doesn't know what that means. She explains that the stars, the flowers of Mother Sky, are each suns very, very far away. They look small because they are far away, she says. Yes, Dak says, amazed by such a complex thought. Yes, things that are far away look small. This is true. Far is far. Jaggle says, alarmed. Dak is stunned by what Aldria says about other suns with worlds and people different from this one. The enormity of the universe that opens up in his mind all at once is overwhelming. Quote, On that day, the old Dak Hammy died. On that day, I truly became Dak Hammy, the seer. Unquote. Chapter 3 Yerks live in pools and are born when their three parents die, producing hundreds of siblings. Esplin 9466 was born on board a ship in outer space, nourished by a portable Candrona ray. He likes to hear the older Yerks speak of their home planet, where the pools were different, bigger. 
Esplin was more or less content with how things were until it was his turn for training. There are many more Yerks than there are Ged hosts, but young Yerks must learn. An old or crippled Ged is used for training, and each of the many young warriors gets just 15 minutes to take over and release it for practice. Quote, I waited patiently, afraid. I admit it, afraid. You hear stories about what it's like, about the hallucinatory sensory input, about the strange sensation of having another mind under your control, about the extension of your own body through unfamiliar limbs. Unquote. Esplin does what he's been trained to do when the Ged's head is pushed under the surface of the pool, finding the ear with his sonar, then feeling his way along to the brain. He stretches through the ear canal, then flattens across the brain, settling his pulps into the wrinkles and connecting to neurons. It's impossible to explain what it's like, suddenly becoming something much larger than yourself, something with limbs, lungs, power, eyes. Esplin uses the Ged's memory to interpret what he sees, getting his first look at the tiny pool. All too soon, his turn is up, and he returns to the murky waters. No one had told me it would be so wonderful, Esplin thinks, and fully disagrees with his friends who found the experience terrifying or sickening. From that moment, Esplin is determined to escape his insignificant pool and have his own set of eyes, to be important enough to have his own host. He would be the most fit, the most useful. Esplin isn't much of a scientist like those who work on the ship's computer, but he can use the computer to learn everything he can about their enemy, the Andalites. Chapter 6 Prince Ciro's family has lived on the hork world for more than three months now. He likes to pretend they are here to observe this intelligent species, but Aldria knows they're really just a cheap lookout for Yerks who will never come. Ciro still believes that only the Yerks who stole those ships were bad, even though they get reports that other worlds are being attacked. They have ships and weapons, and tried to enslave the Hadjabrons, without realizing that the species has several brains instead of one, leaving the colony ship destroyed when they failed. Aldria lets her father tell himself what he likes, not bringing up the fact that the Yerks still on their homeworld don't have a choice but to be peaceful, with an Andalite ship fleet watching them. As for Aldria, all she has to do is talk with Dak Hammy, the hork and record what she learns in the computer, though she's begun to feel like a spy. He understands a lot more than her family realizes. Her father is particularly distracted by memories of how smart the Yerks were, how fascinating to work with in comparison to these childlike beasts. No one believes Aldria that Dax seems... different. Barafin might believe her, but he's depressed and spends his time playing computer games. Their father isn't much better since the hork have nothing interesting to say. Only Aldria's mother is happy, going off to study the local flora and fauna. So, Aldria spends time with Dak. It's not easy. He moves easily through the trees while she labors on the ground, coping with the steep slope of the valley. Then she gets an idea. She spots a climbing animal and asks Dak to catch it for her. It's a chadu, about two feet long, covered in blue feathers, many legs with claws, gliding skin flaps. Gently, Dak uses tree sap on a fingertip to lure the creature. Dak, do you understand the idea of a secret? Aldrea asks. She explains that he must not tell anyone what he sees here. Then she touches the chidu and acquires its DNA. Chapter 7 Aldrea explains as best she can that she has technology, like the ship and computer, that her parents don't know about. Back home, Aldria had known someone whose mother worked on the morphing technology, and she had secretly used it. So, she warns Dak as best she can, then changes into a chidu. The process is a bit frightening for both of them, since she's only done it once before, but she finishes quickly. Other than the mouth, so strange for an Andalite, Aldria adjusts to the little body and races up into the trees with Dak. There are no predators here so the little animal is quick and calm and great at flying and gliding. Dak gets used to the change before long and is eager to show Aldria the world in the trees. She forgets about the ground, focuses on the vertical expanses of the forest, and Dak guides her, understanding instinctively that Aldria now has the mind of a chadu, 
which knows how to navigate this place. They jump from branch to branch with hundreds of feet of empty air beneath them, and Dak swings around the top of a tree with the freedom of youth. Aldria glides after him. Dak leads Aldria as easily as she could have shown someone around the meadow back home. They come to a monstrous tree, nearly half a mile tall. That is the tribe tree. It is the center of culture where the elders meet, and it is dotted with platforms where harvest bark is kept. Aldria is fascinated by the industry here, as well as the teaching of children. There is a two-hour limit on morphing. At the very top of the tribe tree, Aldria turns back into herself and looks out from a platform over the forest. She's able to look up, out, and down with her four eyes in all directions at once. Dak, what is in the deep? She asks. I only know what my people say. What do your people say is in the deep? Terror. They say that terror is in the deep. Chapter 8 It doesn't take long for Esplin to become the leading expert on Andalites, since no one else has cared to learn. He's fascinated by them. They are everything a Yurk isn't. They can run, they can manipulate objects, they can see in all directions, they can fight. With his palps connected to the computer, Esplin can watch the video archives. He watches for strengths and weaknesses. After many months of being passed over, Esplin is called to the infestation pier to try a new species that had just been discovered. He rushes into the ear canal and makes himself comfortable, desperate for sight as well as to prove himself. What a host. Unlike the Ged, it has wonderful eyesight, hearing, and smell. When the mind inside the body, very different from the submissive, tired Ged, begins to fight back, Esplin beats it into submission with gleeful ease. It's lived a simple life of stripping bark off trees and telling stories, never fighting. The commanding Yurks want Esplin to tell them if a body like this can be used to battle the Andalite scum. Esplin looks down at the blades on this body and tries to imagine it. Yes, he says in the creature's guttural voice. These creatures will be our weapons. And so it was that the Yurks chose a planet from which to begin their rampage. Esplin is proud to have been there when the Yurk Empire was truly born, to have controlled the very first Hork Bajir body. Chapter 9 Dak and Aldria listened to the speaking trees one night, nearly two months after her first Chadu transformation. He is grateful to her for teaching him so much but is dismayed when she says he is more or less caught up with her. Still, she is very important to him, his only true companion. Is he still hork Bajir now that he knows so much? Can't be satisfied with little? The speaking trees are hollowed-out Nawin trees that are turned into resonant instruments, and at night the other tribes in the valley communicate with this one. Dak translates. Apparently the southern tribe has lost some of its people to new monsters of the deep, though they are strangely small. Hearing their description, Aldria becomes alarmed and asks Dak if he can request for a question to be sent to the southern tribe. Though a seer, Dak is young and hesitant, but Aldria seems as desperate and emotional as he's ever seen her. So, he shouts up at the speaking tree, and her question about the monster's gate is transmitted. What is it that you fear, Aldria? I'm not sure. You do not know if your fear is realized, Aldria, but you know what your fear is. <laughs> you keep surprising me, Dak. Every day you're sharper, smarter. You learn so quickly. Your use of language, your perception, it's incredible. You could enroll in an Andalite Academy tomorrow and... The answer comes back. The monsters walk strangely, as if their legs are two different lengths. Aldria is suddenly terrified, her fears confirmed, for only stunted creatures like the Ged ever evolved in such a lopsided way. It suddenly becomes clear that Dak is a seer not because the Andalites have come, but because the Yurks have. Chapter 10 Aldria does her best to explain that the Yurks are an enemy, and Dak understands that they are the predators she taught him about. Before she can go into much detail, however, she realizes that the Yurk ships must be in orbit and will soon notice her family's settlement when her father sends his nightly report. 
she takes off running, fighting the slope of the valley. It's a hard two miles, and she spends the whole time hoping against hope that her punctual father forgot to send the report tonight. She's breathing hard when the scoop comes into view, where her mother, father, and little brother go about their nightly routines. That's the image Aldria keeps in her heart. Chapter 11 After two days in his hork bajir body, Esplin is still enjoying it, other than the confused, crying voice of the mind. He looks around at the Andalite ships that would normally have grassy floors and holographic skies for ceilings, thinking about the dome ships that are being developed that have full-scale parks inside. All useless amenities for parasite worms accustomed to the depths of yerk pools. By now, Esplin's people have six Andalite ships, three well-armed ships stolen from the Skritna, and one fast ship taken from the Ongakic. Things are changing in yerk society. There will always be the Council of Thirteen, but now there will also be Vissers and sub vissers in command. They will soon have a whole planet of hork controllers. A report comes in that there is a single Andalite outpost on the planet below, and it must be destroyed before the Yerk fleet is noticed. If there are any survivors, Esplin and another in a hork body will go down to hunt them. This is yet another opportunity for Esplin to climb the ranks as the most knowledgeable about Andalite fighting techniques, and he rides down to the surface in one of the fighter ships. It hovers above the Andalite scoop, while the pilots laugh with glee at what they're about to do. Esplin carefully counts their prey, noting that there are only three visible, not four. The fourth is probably inside the scoop, says Carger, an unpleasant sub visor in a hork body. No, Esplin says. Andalites never take shelter unless they must, in the depth of a cold night, or to avoid harsh weather, or to fend off an attack, or when they must serve aboard spacecraft. Andalites are creatures of open spaces. They hate being confined in any way. They become nervous and afraid if they don't have large areas in which to run. You are quite the Andalite lover, Esplin. I will kill more Andalites if I know their habits. The pilots power up the shredder cannon. Esplin warns them to wait until the fourth Andalite is in sight, but Carger commands the pilots to fire. Chapter 12 Just as she comes into sight of the scoop, the whole clearing explodes under shredder fire as the moisture in the air, soil, and grass is superheated. Aldria screams and screams, knowing her family is in that fire, and attacks Dak with her tail blade when he tries to lead her away. He catches the blow on his arm spike and tries to get her to look away, but her stock eyes can still watch the carnage. Calmly, he convinces her that they need to run now before the attackers find her. As you said, Aldria, this is why I was born a seer, to save my people from these yurks who have done this evil thing. But I cannot do it alone. You must help me. No, I won't help you to understand, but I will help you to kill the yurks. That I will do. I will help you kill them. Chapter 13 Despite his outer calm, Dak is badly shaken by what he saw. Aldria had not taught him about weapons, wars, and yurks. This is so different from the monsters of the deep. The only thing he does know is that you must run from monsters, lest more come looking for scraps. In his heart, Dak knows he can't go to anyone for help because his people will look to him, the seer, for answers. Two hork come running over. Do not fear, brothers, Dak says. Oh, we're not afraid, they say in a strange tone, and Jack realizes he doesn't recognize them. Are they from another tribe? Then, incredibly, one of them slashes Dak across the chest. Dumbfounded, Dak looks at the injury, and can't believe it when the other strikes him again, using feet and elbow blades. They leave him and lunge at Aldria. Dak, fight back, she cries, attacking with her tail blade. These aren't real hork Still, Dak can only stare. This was no accident, as sometimes happens during harvest. This was intentional, deliberate. Why? And more than that, they were trying so hard to cut Aldria that she would surely die from it. Dak looks at the blades on his arms, and it's like he's seeing them for the first time. Weapons. He understands the power of his body. When Aldria calls for help, 
he jumps on one of the attacking Horkbajir and slices through his spine. The other attacker runs off, leaving the first to shout, Carter, you coward! And now Aldria is telling Dak they must run, but not before she looks straight into the downed Horkbajir's face to tell him he shall not have this planet. The daughter of Ciro will show you the other side of the Andalite character. And then they run. Chapter 14 Aldria is alone, the only Andalite within millions of miles, with no way to tell anyone about the Yurk invasion. She's amazed that the hork are so peaceful they don't even realize the danger of their blades. Some of the fiercest-looking creatures in the galaxy, yet entirely naive and kind-hearted. They were perfect targets for the violent Yurks. As they run, Dak insists she tell him about the Yurks. So, she explains that they are parasites, that they take over the brains of other people. She explains how her father, Ciro, made contact and hoped they would be allies. This is what your parents did here, too, am I correct? They were sent to study us. Yes, but there was a difference. We knew the Yurks to be highly... Dak understands. The Yurks were known to be intelligent and therefore dangerous, while the hork are simple and harmless. Aldria assures Dak that intelligence isn't everything. Her father was very smart, yet easily tricked by the Yurks. Your father made a mistake. The Yurks were content, but by showing them all they did not have, they began to want more. They wanted to be like you, like Andalites. Aldria is amazed by this insight, then realizes that Dak also envies the knowledge and other assets her people have. She and Dak quickly piece together that the Yurks plan to turn the hork into a dangerous army. And Aldria encourages Dak to understand what he can do for his people as Seer. They will listen to him. They can learn to fight. Dak doesn't like the idea. He'd hoped to bring his people art, music, writing, not killing. Perhaps they'd be better off without those things, living happily and peacefully. He will never know, because now the hork are doomed. They will either learn to be killers or to be slaves, and Dak resents Aldria for making it clear she would rather his people be killers. It doesn't bother her greatly. Aldria is more than willing to lead the hork against the evil Yurks who had murdered her family. Just then, Shredder Fire explodes over their heads. With nowhere to hide, Dak and Aldria plunge ever downward into the swirling blue mist of Father Deep. Chapter 15 The steep downward run is painful, but there is no time for Aldria to morph into a Chidu. The only thing that saves the pair from cannon fire is the forest of enormous trees the ships have to maneuver around. Bleeding and wheezing, Aldria keeps running at panic speed. They come across other hork who recognize their seer and want to know what's happening. Run! Run away! Dak cries, but it's too late. The shredders vaporize the poor people, and there is no choice but to put distance between them and bystanders. Aldria feels guilty for bringing Dak along. He could easily blend in with his people while she runs, but there's no time for guilt. Even now, Aldria thinks a few sacrificed hork are nothing compared to her need to kill every yerk. She focuses on breathing the thickly oxygenated air of the deep valley. Finally, they reach the layer of blue mist. Chapter 16 Dak knows the stories. Mother Sky gives air and light. Father Deep gives soil and water. But no one goes into the deep and lives, for monsters dwell there. He and Aldria slow down now that they are concealed in the thick mist. Even if the monsters get them, at least Dak can die like a normal hork not by alien cannon fire. They walk through thick grass. Suddenly, a Ged controller holding a shredder appears, but the air is so dense that the shot simply heats the air around him. Shredders are designed for the vacuum of space. The pair hurry away from his screams, coming across more Geds with Shredders and the hork controller who ran away before. For a moment, Dak and Aldria are in a sticky spot. But then the massive three-fingered hands of the Jubba Jubba snatch the attackers away. Using a dropped Shredder and Aldria's tail blade, they escape the monster and run deeper. A Jubba Jubba was defeated for the first time in history. Chapter 17 
This was Aldria's first time doing proper battle with her tail. She knows a male Andalite warrior would have severed the Jebba Jebba's arm with a single strike while it took her three, but she's satisfied nonetheless and curious about the way Dak looks at her in awe. She hopes future battles will be with the Yerks. They can't turn back. Yerks will be everywhere, looking for them. Dak knows they can't do anything right now, but he's sure hork are being taken away as they speak. He should have stayed with them, made sure they ran or fought, not followed Aldria. And Aldria knows that he will stay with her, because he needs a friend who is knowledgeable more than he needs to be the leader to his people. If she weren't so determined to wage war against the Yerks, she would have felt bad about it. Dak, eventually we must find a way to contact my people. We may have to steal a Yerk ship. We may have to fly, Dak. We may have to go up into space. He stops, and Aldria turns to see what's wrong. You did not have to say that, Aldria. You do not have to hold out a ripe Nawin cone to make me stay with you. All this time together, Aldria, and yet you don't know that I would sacrifice anything for you? Aldria is a mixture of humiliation and indifference. Her mind is full of the deaths of her family and what she must do to get revenge. And she's not capable of apologizing to Dak. So, they keep going deeper. Eventually, the mist thins and they can see better as they walk for hours and hours through bizarrely colorful plant life. Above, the mist is bright blue. Down here, one cannot see the valley above. A creature living here would think the blue mist was the sky. Then, after leveling out a bit, the land just stops. They carefully approach the edge of a sheer cliff. Aldria is nervous on four legs and wonders how Dak can stand being on just two with such a drop-off at their feet. Much to their amazement, the flat cliff walls are covered in windows, doors, walkways, and open spaces connected by stairways. The same is true on this side of the chasm and the other, and below, maybe tens of thousands of feet, they can see the glowing molten core of the planet. Chapter 18 the downside of having a host body is that a yerk feels all its pain. Esplin lays helpless on the ground where Karger abandoned him, alone for hours until he's finally found. They return him to the ship's yerk pool and question him, but Esplin knows very little. The Andalite female was with the one hork and Karger ran off. He slowly learns that the pair ran into the blue mist and that many yerks were killed by terrible monsters. The Andalite probably died too. Esplin disagrees. Andalites are the dominant species in this part of the galaxy for a reason. But no one listens, and Esplin is once again trapped in the pool of his birth. It's a relief when he's given a new hork host body several days later. His commanding officer finally admits that the Andalite's body has not been found among the carnage of the mist monsters. So the search continues. Now an official sub visor Esplin can command troops to go after the Andalite but he chooses to go alone as a spy among the hork -Bajir. He has a secret goal, to capture the Andalite and make her his host body. All his ambitions will be realized. Chapter 19 Now it is clear how the geography of this planet works. The dead surface, the trees of the cracked valleys, the strip of mist where monsters roam, and the cliff faces along the drop to the core. Aldria wonders how old the Cliff City is, for it looks completely empty as she and Dak walk down and down the stairways. It's nerve-wracking, since there are no railings. Dak and Aldria make for a wide, dark opening big enough for a fleet of starships. It's a relief to step inside, away from the drop. The mystery of this place feels safer than the threat of the Yerks, so the pair take the chance to rest, though the absence of trees or grass is unpleasant. Dak falls asleep quickly while Aldria struggles, as usual. We no longer have predators to attack us, her mother once explained. But evolution does not just throw away adaptations that were necessary once. The animals we evolved from were prey for millions of years. They lived in vast herds, always watched by hungry predators. This was before we developed our tail blades, and we had no protection but speed. We still feel the need to watch for predators. It may be a million years before we lose that instinct. Aldria mourns the loss of her mother, a scientist, feminine in ways Aldria isn't. 
and Aldria wonders if that instinct to look for predators must now be directed towards the parasites. The only thing that can save the hork race from enslavement would be the arrival of a full-fledged Andalite war fleet, but she has no way to send a Z-space message. And even if she somehow gets a message out, it will take two months for the ships to arrive. Looking at Dak, Aldria wonders at his loyalty. The way he said he'd do anything for her, it was almost romantic. Maybe she's just lonely, and that's why she's thinking like that. He's her only friend, and she's asking him to become a military general. Chapter 20 Dak wakes and stands watch. He thinks deeply. He recognizes that Aldria is his friend as well as an orphan hungry for revenge. He cannot follow her blindly, but he doesn't know what to do. The light begins to change in the cavern, and Dak looks up to see a hole in the ceiling as wide as a tree trunk. He calls Aldria over, and they see that it goes all the way to the sky, lined with reflective crystals that carry the sun's light down. The walls of the cavern become visible and seem to be covered in animals. Waking up, the brightly colored creatures open glittering eyes and small wings. They flutter to the floor, less than half Dak's height, and resemble large chadoos. Then they all file out, ignoring the intruders. Only about six of the creatures approach Dak and Aldria. You are a hork -bajir. What are you doing here, hork -bajir? There are no trees here. There is no bark for you to eat. The creatures aren't much interested in Aldria or in the Yerk threat, and turn their backs, expecting the pair to leave. But Dak refuses. He demands answers. We are the Arn. I am named Quatsinicon. The one who spoke very briefly explains that the monsters of the mist were designed to keep the hork in their zone, to maintain the balance, but is easily intimidated when Dak grabs him firmly, but gently. Aldria pushes the point by holding her blade to the Arn's throat. So, much as Dak regrets it, the creature explains the balance. Chapter 21 Quatsinicon leads the pair to another part of the Wall City and shows them a huge view screen, far more advanced than the carved stairways or anything else on this planet. He shows them images from 12,000 years ago when an asteroid hit the planet, causing the cracks. Though the Arn were intelligent, they couldn't achieve good enough space flight to escape, so they froze a few thousand people on the moon and waited for things to settle. They had to carefully engineer the planet to be livable, to maintain what atmosphere remained in the valleys. Aldria already knows where this is going, but lets the Arn talk. He explains the oxygen-making trees and the species designed to look after them. Dak is surprised to learn that the hork were genetically created to be tree herders, that the monsters of the mist kept them in their zone, and that the Arn have remained below. At first, Aldria is angered by the presumption of this race manipulating a planet, but Dak is much calmer. You created the hork -Bajir. Then you need us. Dak explains what is about to happen, that the Yerks plan to enslave every hork on the planet. It is now that Quatsinicon realizes that Dak is a seer, a rare hork born with above Arn intelligence, despite their best efforts to prevent such a thing. In the Arn's minds, such an unstable element is dangerous. But he can't deny the logic that the invaders will one day make it through the mist and down into the Wall City. Later, Aldria compliments Dak on his ruthlessness. I have had a very good example to follow. Chapter 22 it's easy to spy amongst people who don't expect a spy, can't even fathom one. Esplin is in the body of Fet Mashar, and all it takes to explain his absence is saying, I am back. Here, the infiltration will not be slow, the way it will have to be on more intelligent planets. Here, it will be swift. Already, they captured a hundred a day, and that number will only rise. In no time, Esplin learns that Dak Hammy is the hork helping Aldria, the daughter of Prince Ciro. It's a nice bit of irony. There was the fool who showed Yurks the universe, and his daughter would become the first Andalite controller. A Yurk pool has been laboriously created out of a felled tree, and hork are brought to it every day. No one stops them. It gets everyone in a good mood for taking over the galaxy. So they are quite surprised when an army of giant, horrible monsters descends upon them, led by a single small, bluish-purple Andalite female accompanied by Dak Hammy. 
Esplin recognizes a new irony. How funny it would be if there was Prince Ciro, who freed the Yerks without knowing the danger, and his daughter Aldria, who sent them back to the pools. In that moment, Esplin thinks the dangerous young Andalite beautiful. He plans to tell her when he takes control of her brain. Chapter 23 Dak and Aldria learned to control the monsters, then they were assembled from all over the valley. The genetically created creatures are horrifying and, were they not at war, Aldria knows that the Arn should be punished for playing with bodies like that. The next step is to get the hork to attack alongside these monsters. Dak still resents Aldria for pushing him into this, for encouraging him to use his title as seer to turn his people into warriors. But he does it. Do not fear. I am Dak Hammy. I am the seer, sent to teach and to lead. Do not be afraid. These monsters will not harm you. We go to destroy the invaders. We go to kill the Yerks. Soon, started by Aldria, a chant rises within the gathered hork as they follow from the trees. Do as he does. 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 Though he knows the necessity, Dak is angry with Aldria for knowing his simple people so well. Her main goal today, more important than the hork peaceful lives, is to board an Andalite spaceship and send a message to the fleet. It's the only way to save the planet. Dak will have to lead the charge while she does this. Have you fought in many battles, Aldria? You asked me to kill my own people today and to lead my people in killing their brothers. You say they are not hork but Yerks. But when the dead have given up their souls to Mother Sky, there will be hork bodies lying dead. When Aldria tries to justify this, Dak silences her. Chapter 24 Hundreds of chanting hork follow the horde of monsters led by Dak and Aldria. More and more, Dak sees the Andalites and the Arn as little better than the Yerks, always so smart and manipulative. The hork were created by one, enslaved by another, and weaponized by a third. He knows he has no choice, but it makes him sick. The army arrives at the felled tree turned into a pool, beside which sits a stolen Andalite ship. Dak looks at Aldria as they give the mental commands to the monsters, and Aldria looks straight ahead, thinking of her family. Chaos immediately takes hold as the monsters advance and the Yerks fire shredders into the crowd. While Aldria makes for the spaceship, Dak weaves through the battle to climb up the tree for a look at the Yerks in their natural state. A controller rushes at Dak, and he defends himself. And now, the watching hork know what to do. Chapter 25 War is not what Aldria expected. Shouts and cries, moans of pain, explosions, terrible smells. She runs for the now unguarded fighter ship, running through the open hatch into the quiet. Quickly, she mind links with the computer to send a message, hoping that she will be believed despite her young female appearance. This is Aldria Iskillian Fallon. I am communicating from the hork world. I a controller looms over her and blocks Aldria's attack. He hits her across the face, causing her knees to buckle. I don't think I can allow you to call for help, Aldria, daughter of Ciro. Aldria is ready to die, but the Yurk in hork form informs her that he plans to make her a host, and the first ever Andalite controller. He kicks her just to be sure she doesn't do anything while he fires up the ship to destroy the army of monsters outside. However, she does the one thing he didn't expect, morph into a Jubba Jubba. She could have killed him easily in that form, but she doesn't. Aldria tosses him aside, seals the hatch, and demorphs in order to send the full message. The Yerks are here. I said, the Yerks are here. Chapter 26 Though the monsters don't fight long, the hork drop out of the trees to take up the fight, as Dak showed them. Eventually, the fighter ship Aldria boarded turns towards the battlefield, but everyone looks the same, so it can't fire. Instead, it turns again, now towards the felled tree yerk pool, and fires. The log breaks in two, and the gray water runs down the valley wall. Dak's friend, Jaggle, gives the order to squish the helpless yerk slugs where they fall. Aldria joins Dak, and is horrified by the sight of the nightmare dance. It's a relief to call the hork back to the trees, though Dak is amazed by the way they listen to him. 
they now have no choice but to follow him into a new future. Quote, The monsters in our valley were destroyed that day. Only a few survived. But that was all right, because we didn't need monsters anymore. We had become them. Unquote. Chapter 27 A full seven months pass when Aldria had expected it to take two. She can't be sure why. She and Dak use that time to perfect the art of guerrilla warfare within the hork army. They hide in the trees or with the Arn, but they are losing. The Yerks are doing their terrible work in other valleys, faster than the resistance can spread, and they have created new, painful versions of shredders called Dracon Beams. In the rain, the army retreats after a tough battle. Quatsinikon is never happy to see them, saying they'll bring war here, but Dak reminds him that war will come anyway. However, the Arn have been busy. They've altered their brains slightly so that an increase in pressure will kill them immediately, so no Yerk slug can occupy them. The Arn now believe that the Yerks will leave them alone once they discover the Arn can't be hosts. Quatsinikon isn't quite willing to believe that the Yerks will destroy what they can't use. Dak still struggles with the choice that has been made for his people. His friend Jaggle, once so gentle, is now a killer admired by his partner Delph. The couple faces a life of war together. It makes Aldria especially sad when she thinks of her and Dak's closeness, and she longs for the old days when she could morph into a chadu and climb trees together. When the rain stops, they look up and Aldria sees lights in the sky that indicate a space battle. She laughs maniacally, <laughs> certain that everything will be all right now that the Andalites are here. Chapter 28 The Andalites land and want to speak with Aldria, but she insists Dak be included in the trip up to the command ship. Clearly the officers don't think much of the fierce-looking, lesser intelligent people. Although Aldria doesn't think so, Dak is sure that his people risk becoming pawns in this war, be it to the Yerks or Andalites. He is determined that this war is no longer the hork responsibility. It is the Andalites. The Andalite commanders come down to the clearing in a particularly beautiful ship called the Jahar. Aldria is surprised to see Alaran, the warrior who once admonished her father for his mistake with the Yerks. Now he is War Prince Alaran, full of authority and disdain. Nevertheless, despite his displeasure, he takes Aldria and Dak up into orbit. Dak doesn't get to enjoy his first off-world trip. There is so much to discuss, and it's not easy. Alaran laughs outright at the suggestion that Dak has anything to teach them. But Dak launches into a full list of bases, weapons, mining pits, and spacecraft the Yerks now possess, including a new thing nicknamed a blade ship, made to resemble hork spikes. That gets the prince's attention. He and his officers are shocked that Dak and Aldria have led military missions against the Yerk bases without a fleet to back them up. Alaran brought only enough fighting ships to battle the original Yerk fleet, not the large-scale operation now in place. Not enough to battle 40,000 hork hosts in a dozen new fighter ships. Only a thousand Andalites have arrived. The main fleet went elsewhere to follow up on another report, everyone having assumed that a young female like Aldria, daughter of foolish Ciro, had exaggerated the problem on the hork world. It will take a year for the main fleet to reach them, which won't help now as Yerk ships approach. Chapter 29 Nowadays, Esplin is known as sub Visser 12 so close to being one of the nine Vissers. He's worked hard to get here as the Empire expands and deals with the nuisance that is Dak, Hammy, and Aldria. He's learned about Dak, the seer who had turned his people into warriors. Fortunately, the Andalites who have arrived are not a full fleet. Esplin and the rest close in, getting close enough to pierce the shields. <coughs> One Andalite fighter ship is destroyed, two Yerk bug ships explode, and the fight begins. Esplin's ship is hit and has to descend to the nearest valley with the enemy on its tail, but the Andalite ship is destroyed by a Dracon beam from a nearby base. The battle wasn't good, but the Andalites will be in big trouble if they don't get backup for the next one. Chapter 30 The war intensifies as everyone once again waits for Andalite reinforcements. New ships arrive sometimes, the Yerks are pushed out of Dak's home valley, and Prince Alaran leads victories. But there are always fewer Andalites and more hork enslaved. 
Six months of this pass by, and the numbers don't look good. The army hides below with the Arn. While Quatsinicon was right that the Yerks wouldn't use the Arn as hosts now that they had that deadly mechanism in their heads, the small, colorful people are still used as miners and laborers. Only this valley is clear of the Yerk infestation. For now. After a while, Dak notices that there are always a few Andalite guards in a particular spot. With Aldria, he crosses a narrow bridge across the chasm, and it's made very clear that they won't be allowed in. Dak takes their insults, such as genius, in stride, but wants to know what's behind that door. However, he can't hide his frustration from Aldria. We have fought side by side with your people, and you Andalites still treat us like inferiors, like errand runners, or servants, or like idiot clowns to amuse you. They didn't know who you are. They figured you were just some regular hork -bajir. Ah, yes. They assumed I was just one of the stupid hork -bajir. The simple-minded hork -bajir. The expendable, irrelevant, foolish hork -bajir. You Andalites have more respect for the vicious Yerks or the cowardly Arn than you have for the hork -bajir who fight and die at your sides. All that matters to your people is intelligence. Well, I've learned enough about Yerk and Andalite and Arn intelligence to make me sick. We may be simple people, but we don't use biology to invent monsters, and we don't enslave other species, and we don't unleash a plague of parasites on the galaxy, endangering every other free species, and then go swaggering around like the lords of the universe. No, we're too stupid for that. We're too stupid to lie and manipulate. We're too stupid to be ruthless. We're too stupid to know how to build powerful weapons designed to annihilate our enemies. Until you came, Andalite, we were too stupid to know how to kill. You've been wanting to say all that for a long time, haven't you? They embrace as Dak recalls what the hork -Bajir were before all this, and Aldria promises to stand with him if ever she has to choose between him and her people. He appreciates her words, but doesn't believe them. Chapter 31 The first thing Aldria did was try to get Aloran to tell her about the guarded door, going so far as to take his hand... This doesn't go well, but she does acquire his DNA. Morphing technology is so new that most people are hardly aware of it. At first, Dak is unhappy about the visit, but is impressed by her idea to use her morphing abilities. She demonstrates how easy it is with Delph, taking the female hork hand and letting the process happen again, which reassures Dak. Morphing into Aloran is simple, the easiest transformation she's done so far. It's strange to feel herself becoming bigger, stronger, with a more powerful tail blade. She feels clumsy at this size. Doing her best swagger, she marches up to the guards and commands them to open up, which they do. When they express doubts about the hork -Bajir with her, she, as Aloran, says, They do all look alike. Open up. Stay out here. Watch for the girl. She may come back. Inside is an abandoned room of equipment and machinery running quietly. Aldria uses her Aloran body to gain access to the computer, and has it explain the purpose of this facility. It is creating a virus, one that is meant to wipe out exactly one type of creature, hork -Bajir. Chapter 32 Rage at the Andalites fills Dak, as well as sadness at the thought that all this fighting has been for nothing. The Andalites had decided the war for this planet had failed, it was better to destroy the tools than let them fall into the hands of the enemy. It doesn't really matter if it was Aloran or the Andalite electorate who made the decision. Aldria is more distressed than Dak has seen her since her family died. She tells the computer to put all of that virus into one portable container and returns to her own form to look Dak in the eyes, to promise him that she will fight what Aloran is doing. It's a small comfort. Dak now knows his people are doomed, but at least he has Aldria. She admits that she didn't think she would make this choice, back when she promised she would, but now she feels she has no choice at all. Dak carries the virus while Aldria lifts her shredder. Quote, I'd seen many brave deeds since the war had begun, but none braver than that. The Andalite girl turning against her own people to save mine. I cared very much for her then. I probably had before that, but that was when I finally realized it. With all her lies, all her inbred Andalite arrogance, all her manipulations, I loved her." Unquote. They fire on the facility until consoles and machines explode, then they bust out past the guards. 
The noise is sure to rouse someone who had been asleep. Aldria leads the way to the bridge, where they can toss the virus canister into the planet's core, and they're quickly surrounded by Andalite guards coming across from either side. At the same time, Yurk bug fighter ships fly into the valley. Now everything is alight with explosions. For a moment, Dak cheers for the Andalites as they fight the Yurks. Aloran rushes across the bridge towards them, brave despite all the trouble he causes. I'm going to save this planet, you fool! Give me that canister! Just then, a blade ship flies down and fires, and the middle of the bridge is taken out, leaving Aloran on one side of the gap. Kill them! Kill that Horkbajir! And kill that treasonous spawn of Zeros, too! Aldria is ready to give up together, but Dax sees one last opportunity. Jump! Chapter 33 The pair land on the back of a fighter ship going by. Dak is knocked out while Aldria's leg is broken. He wakes up in confusion, and they can't be sure where they are. So hold on to the virus canister. The ship is rising up out of the deep, and they have to jump again. There's just enough time for Aldria to morph into the shape of the hork female Delph. Dak holds onto her, she holds onto the canister, and they jump. They grab onto the top of a tree and hang there. We're in this together, Dak. If the virus is released, now I will die too. I don't want that. I do, Dak. I'll live or die with you. They share the hork equivalent of a kiss, horns touching, and forget the world for a minute. Unfortunately, when they return to the ground, sub 12 is waiting for them. Chapter 34 It's impossible not to gloat a little bit when your destiny stands in front of you, and Esplin is extremely pleased to see Aldria's morphing technology in action again. The pair are shackled, and the canister carefully carried away. As he waits for the blade ship to finish firing down below, he wonders why Aldria remains a hork It is now that he learns the horrifying truth that she can only stay like that for two hours. Soon she will no longer be an Andalite host, but just another hork At first, Esplin thinks to torture Dak until Aldria complies, but then he just has the guards hold her down so he can infest her now. Ears are pressed together, and Esplin begins the transition. And halfway to Aldria's brain, his palps get their first glimpse. Her Andalite intelligence, her days as army commander, her memories of running across grass. He can hardly contain his excitement, all his ambitions realized. But Esplin forgot one thing. His original host body is still a warrior. He attacks the guards, then pulls the yerk out of Aldria's ear. Chapter 35 Aldria is unharmed, but disturbed. She got a look into Esplin's memories when he was reaching for her brain, and now knows the person behind the enemy. They look at the slug on the floor, not quite wanting to kill it. They're tired of killing. For a moment, the pair wonders if they could fly away together, but soon an Andalite ship is firing at them. They crash and black out. Sometime later, in daylight, Dak wakes up to see Delph's face, though he knows it's really Aldria in there. The time limit has long since passed, so this is her face forever. At first, they seem okay, but then they remember the virus canister. They look up to see the freed hork bringing it to them, with the cap askew, and there is nothing to do but run. They hurry back through the blue mist to the smoking city of the Arn, just in time to see the Andalite task force taking off. The war is lost. It's over. The Andalites are gone. The hork are doomed. Dak isn't ready to give up just yet. There are trees, there are valleys the virus might not reach, and there is whatever future Dak and Aldria have together, now that they are both hork Epilogue The story ends, and Tobias is in awe. Good story. Sad story. Jara says, now that he's finished it. Jara Hemi tell. Father tell Jara Hemi. Father father tell father. I tell daughter. Story have no end. Stories go on. Tobias is surprised to learn that Jara is the grandchild of Dak and Aldria. They named their child Ciro, and Ciro named his child Jara. But what about Esplin 9466? Jara says Tobias already knows him, and Tobias is horrified to realize that this was a story in part about the Animorph's greatest enemy, the one who killed Prince Elfangor back when this all started. 
the Yerk who was obsessed with Andalites had survived and risen through the ranks to become known as Visser III. For a moment, Tobias feels very depressed, but it helps to look at the free Horkbajir living here, who have survived war and viruses and enslavement. Jara's daughter is named Toby in honor of Tobias, since he helped establish this settlement. Good name, Jara says. Toby is different. Yes, his mate agrees. Toby is different. When you say Toby is different, Tobias says, thinking, and Toby looks up at him with a serious smile. Yes, Tobias, friend of the hork Yes, I am different. Stories do, indeed, have no end. The end. I appreciate the prologue to this book that sets the scene, but it's kind of funny that this is supposed to be all one story told to Tobias about Dak Hammy. It features three unique perspectives, <laughs> including a Yerk's story that Dak couldn't possibly have known anything about, making it impossible that it could be passed on to his grandchild. Then again, Dak and Aldria probably talked a lot, and Aldria experienced many of Esplin's memories in their final meeting. How did Esplin escape that crashing ship anyway? We can only assume he got lucky and found one of the unconscious guards to crawl into an ear and survive. And even if we have to flex our brain muscles a bit to make it make sense, the framing device that is Tobias listening to Jara makes sense in the context of the story, which highlights the fact that the story goes on. The hork Chronicles give us the story of the very beginning of the Yerk War on the galaxy, though I think the Elemist book might go back even further. In total, there are four extra novels. The Elemist, Visser, the hork Chronicles, and the Andalite Chronicles. The Elemist and Visser are harder to track down. Chronologically, the next volume is the Andalite Chronicles, followed by the more than 54 books in the main Animorphs series. And I have skipped ahead and read volume 54, which even then doesn't have a classic ending. The war might end, people might die, but life goes on. Fortunately or unfortunately, we can't play our favorite game today. Did the cover artist read the book? It's pretty obvious that Romas Kukalis read quite a bit of the hork Chronicles prior to painting the beautiful front and back covers. Seriously, this is one of my favorite science fiction covers because it feels so lifelike. Bonus points for having both a front and a back. The portrait of Dak and Aldria is so striking, especially after reading their personal accounts of war and death and love. The back cover then feels bittersweet, since it depicts a time when Dak simply showed Aldria his world without worry. And, though she wasn't entirely happy with her lot in life, she listened. In the end, Aldria was granted her wish to become a warrior and fight the Yerks but it's implied that her reputation was as bad, if not worse than, her father's. Ciro's kindness is the sarcastic name for the day the Yerks used the technology given to them to rise up and rampage across the galaxy, enslaving host bodies. And Aldria's account says that her name later became a curse and a cruel joke amongst her people, presumably because she failed to repel the Yerk threat from the hork world. Prince Aloran may have perpetuated some unkind stories about her, if I had to guess. He always looked down on her as a female and as Ciro's daughter. Spoiler alert, Aloran shows up in the Andalite Chronicles as well, eventually becoming the first Andalite host taken by the Yerks by, you guessed it, our own Esplin 9466. Speaking of Andalites, during the introduction, I alluded to the fact that there are people who think the official artwork for the Animorphs books doesn't actually match Applegate's descriptions of what Andalites look like. Let's take a look at that argument now. Andalitetruth.org, linked in the YouTube description box, is a website completely dedicated to this topic, which I stumbled across a couple years ago while looking for pictures of Andalites. As soon as you go there, it says, The torso is a lie. It's a really simple, old-looking website that shows an excerpt from Animorphs, which is then followed by submitted fan drawings of how people imagine Andalites actually look. Here's the quote underneath the line. The official art has always been wrong, now it can be told. The Andalite. From a distance, you'd think he was a small horse or a deer. He has four hooved feet that flash with amazing speed. His upper body looks like a horse's neck and head, except that when he gets close enough, you see that he has two smaller, human-sized arms sticking out. 
His head is kind of a triangle, with two huge almond-shaped eyes. Those are his main eyes. There are two extra eyes, each stuck atop a sort of stalk. The stalks stick out of the top of his head and move, pointing the extra eyes in any direction. Compelling! Though it's hard not to be prejudiced about this considering that Mattingly and Kukalis both painted so many centaur, semi-humanoid versions of Andalites. They painted Elfengor, Aldria, Aloran, and Elfengor's little brother Axe. And these characters interact with humans and hork who are truly humanoid with shoulders, chests, torsos, etc. There are multiple Andalites who have romantic relationships with humans, morphing into human forms to be together. And it's easier to see that happening if both species have a full torso to complete the recognition of minds and feelings. That being said, I can see the website's point. Even when I've posted pictures of these books on Instagram, I've gotten comments regarding this debate. The official artwork really leans into the centaur comparison, giving the Andalites chins, for example, despite having no mouths, and therefore no jaws. But based on Applegate's descriptions, the Andalites are probably much more alien than we tend to imagine. Based on the paragraph quoted by AndaliteTruth.org, their faces are a bit more like the green alien emoji than the glamorous, chiseled faces Kukalis paints for them. And in regards to humanoid torsos and necks and things, I will say that in The Andalite Chronicles, we see a few more differences clearly articulated. Elfungor meets a young Earth woman named Lauren and observes her. He's shocked when she turns her head to look back over her shoulder, which Andalite necks are too stiff to do, thus the eyes on stocks. She can lift herself up using her arms, which Andalite arms are definitely too weak to do, and she likes to hold hands for comfort, which is a very human habit Elfanger learns to accommodate. It seems like a species with a torso is more likely to hold hands than a species without one, Having a much larger lower body and less strong, flexible arms would probably make holding hands impractical. Maybe having six fingers also poses a challenge. Though I can't recall if Applegate specifies six fingers and a thumb or six including a thumb. What do you think? Do you like imagining blue centaurs or something much more alien? There is great fan art out there to help you decide, one way or the other. I also found there's something called the Fandalites podcast if you're interested in more Animorphs content. Some of the art featured on AndaliteTruth.org is frankly hilarious, or nightmare-inducing, while some is genuinely beautiful. The literal blue horse with arms sticking out of its neck and eye stalks stuck on its head really bothers me, <laughs> and this condensed version of Kukalis' art really made me laugh. I fell into a rabbit hole googling Andalites, so here is some of what I found. Apologies to everyone listening on Spotify and Apple Podcasts right now. The images I'm talking about are included in the YouTube video. I love this picture by Cinnamon Bunza from the Andalite Chronicles with Elfengor in his Mustang. Don't ask. Here's a taxon from that same chapter by Monster Man 8. Ronu on DeviantArt drew a series of pictures that show Andalites in a body shape like what Kukalis painted for the official Chronicle covers, but with a few small deviations making the Andalites' horse-like legs much thinner, more unicorn-like, and editing the face shape to be more triangular, since there isn't an articulated jaw. Another artist named Lakofa drew similar Andalites, though with thicker horse bodies and tails, which supports the idea that all Andalite strength is in the tail and very little in the upper body. Another artist called Their Bombs redrew an Animorph cover with their slightly furrier interpretation. So cute! There are some pictures that lean on the creepier side, more loosely interpreting hooves and hands, like this one submitted anonymously to andalitetruth.org. It's really interesting to look at pictures drawn by people who tried to imagine non-humanoid versions of these alien creatures. A Reddit user named Iowasi posted a series of images showing their interpretations, including how the Andalites might eat with their hooves, how their six-fingered hands might work, how their tail spikes might look, and their overall body structure. Artist Yohani has contributed very cute drawings that they refer to as space deers that really deviate from anything human-like, yet look fluid and beautiful. Hello Puns and Joe Techsmith did as well, fully removing anything that could be called a torso above the horse-like body, instead giving the Andalites small shoulders and arms right above the shoulder joint for their first set of horse or deer legs, the head supported on a longish neck. Out of curiosity, I watched the 1998 episode, My Name is Jake, of the Animorphs TV show to see how the Andalites looked. 
The effects and cinematography crew were surprisingly creative when it comes to these centaur-like aliens. While nothing looks especially real, they did a good job of hiding things in semi-darkness to help create the illusion of life and danger. Elfungor emerges from his ship, backlit. The hooves of a horse walk down the ramp. He falls to the ground, where we see his eye stalks outlined by the bright light coming from the ship. And we see close-ups of his huge green eyes. Only one shot of Visser Three shows an Andalite's full head and torso, and a couple show the full head of either. As for the entire body altogether, we only get a shadow on the wall as Visser Three turns into a monster and eats the squirming Elfengor. Similarly, there are only a few partial shots of the hork foot soldiers, or the yurks inside people's heads. Rudimentary, but creative. I'm sure I would have been really into it as a kid. <laughs> Out of further curiosity, I looked up the Animorphs' action figures, which are sort of like animal transformers. Marco turns into a gorilla, Rachel a lion, Tobias a hawk, Jake a tiger, and, well, no Cassie, I guess. Annoying, considering she's the only black character out of the main group, as well as my favorite. Anyway, and there's Visser Three, who turns into the inferno creature he used to kill Elfangor. Oh, and I guess these are technically transformers? Ha! <laughs> The box is so over the top. Changes from Inferno Creature to Evil Andalite. I found some other Transformers toys that have three forms. This one can be a hork an Andalite, or the Inferno Beast. I especially like the illustrations on the box. The hork is very reminiscent of Kukalis's work on today's book, with the same front-sweeping horns and bird-like beak and red eyes. The Andalite is yellow, for some reason, and looks like he was crossed with C-3PO from Star Wars. The Inferno Beast can look like whatever, since Applegate didn't really describe it in the first book. What did you think about the story as a whole? Was this your first experience with Animorphs? Rereading it at 30, I'm surprised by how dark the hork Chronicles was. I appreciate that even though the vocabulary is fairly simple, designed for young teenagers, the topics never treat the reader like they're dumb or ignorant. It's frank about the nature of war and the characters who enact it. All three narrators become warriors through different means. Esplin 9466 is a yerk driven by ambition and intelligence, so it's not that surprising he becomes a villain. But Aldria and Dak are very different. Dak is a seer, much more intelligent than anyone else on his planet, but he's essentially happy with the life he leads as a hork aside from his desire to visit the stars. Did he ever get to? I don't think so. But he had Aldria to tell him the things he wanted to know. His position as seer reminds me a little bit of the Dune books, which feature a prophecy that is at once true and false. The main character, Paul, arrives on a world where religion has been carefully cultivated, so everyone is ready to be superstitious, to believe. In Dak's case, he is a genetic mistake, more intelligent than the Arn who created him, a 1 in 10,000 occurrence. And at the same time, he is part of his people's system of beliefs. He is meant to lead them, and so they follow. It is a burden that weighs heavily on his mind as he follows Aldria into battle again and again. What about Aldria? She is the most challenging character to understand. Daughter of a social pariah, destined to become a joke to her people, Aldria started out as a slightly rebellious teenage girl who wanted to join the military rather than become a scientist, like most females. Were there not a war going on, she might have been a great force for change within Andalite culture. She points out that females are better at using morphing technology, thus making their smaller tail blades negligible, and pushes against her parents' expectations. But alas, her whole family is sent far away to live on the peaceful world of the hork a place with no predators or changes. Of course, the destruction of her family is what really drives Aldria to become a warrior, to the point where she scares Dak. There are parts of the book where I wondered if Aldria and Dak should really stay together, since Aldria is so manipulative and warmongering. She's willing to turn Dak, her friend, into a killer to lead an army of hork against the invaders, sacrificing their peaceful culture. At one point, she makes the selfish decision to stay with Dak and the others when she knows separating from them might save lives. She doesn't hesitate to threaten the Arn into helping her. She teaches the hork to watch Dak, their seer, closely and do as he does, which is to kill Yurks, using what she knows of their simple nature to drive them towards violence for her cause. She inspires them to follow Dak, who must then demonstrate how to kill a hork despite being possessed against their will by a Yurk. 
There are moments when Dak wonders if all the hork dying would be better than being enslaved or turning into killers. Of course, when confronted with Aloran's virus later, he knows that's the wrong choice. But he hates that Aldria made the choice for them to become warriors. Page 181 in Chapter 32 has a particularly interesting scene that says a lot about Aldria and her relationship with Dak. It is from Dak's perspective, and he realizes that Aldria has chosen to stand with the hork -Bajir. She has been lying to him for a long time now, despite being friends. She was sure that when push came to shove, she would choose to be with her fellow Andalites rather than the hork -Bajir, and allow Dak's people to be nothing more than sacrifices in the war. And Dak knew this, deep down, though he felt bound to Aldria through his thirst for knowledge and her being the only person in the universe who truly knew or understood him. However, when Aldria is faced with what Aloran wants to do, use a virus to wipe out the hork population so the Yerks can't use them, she abruptly changes her mind. She can no longer hold on to Andalite society based on principle when she is confronted with the reality that her people are not the golden standard with the highest technology and morals. They are advanced, yes, but arrogant, like Time Lords in Doctor Who. And though she shares that arrogance, she does not have to align with her species as a whole. This is when Aldria and Dak truly become partners, emotionally dedicated to each other. Up until now, Aldria wasn't committed to Dak and used his attachment to her. But now, she is with him, do or die. And when she becomes permanently transformed into a hork -Bajir, they are free to fight together and love each other as equals. Kinda like in James Cameron's Avatar. Until this moment in the book, Aldria sort of does what the Yerks have done. Think of the hork -Bajir as weapons in the war. It's only when she chooses to abandon her own species that her intentions become more noble, rather than caught up in revenge and politics. Dak was right to fear becoming a pawn in a larger game of chess. That's two of the three characters who take turns narrating chapters. What about the Yerk? Esplin 9466 is a bit of a know-it-all, but a very intelligent, ambitious one. I appreciate Applegate's willingness to explore the minds of characters who are not good people, who have a certain logic and passion that is understandable as well as condemnable. Aldria is like that too, and especially Aloran, ruthless and cruel in their own ways. The three main characters in this book are on a spectrum of war. Dak is unwilling, but doing what is necessary for his people's survival. Aldria fights in the name of something, be it justice or revenge and Esplin fights for his own ambitions to rise up and out of the pool he was born in. If we were to grab a real-world event for reference, I would say Esplin and the Yerks are like the Nazis, striving for greatness after feeling weak. Aldria and the Andalites are perhaps similar to America, which failed to get heavily involved in the war until they suffered an attack they wanted revenge for, something like Pearl Harbor that indicated they needed to go all in. And Dak and the hork are like the Jews and other oppressed peoples who found themselves caught up in the current of war, used and abused and killed. I don't mean to say that Applegate was trying to write a one-to-one -one allegory, but it's good to present kids with thought experiments like this that can be applied to real-life conflicts they grow up to learn about. The parasitical Yerks also remind me of the manga-slash-anime Parasite, spelled with a Y, about aliens that rain down on Earth and take over the bodies and minds of humans. The main character in that story manages to stop the parasite from getting beyond his right elbow, thus landing him with a sentient hand. That series is a gory invasion story akin to Junji Ito's Gyo in places, while also being introspective and philosophical in a way that reminds me of Devilman. What does it mean to be human? What does it matter to a parasite? You could also draw comparisons between Yorks and Xenomorphs, since both seem designed to unsettle. While the creatures in Ridley Scott's Alien series lay eggs inside their human hosts in the most uncomfortable way possible, that aren't fit to describe in a children's episode, so too do the Yorks as they crawl into people's ears and brains. It's especially creepy reading about Esplin's goal of enslaving Aldria throughout the book. When it comes to the Yerks using the hork -Bajir, I'm also tempted to find parallels between the hork -Bajir Chronicles and films like Get Out or Sorry to Bother You, but there's no time. Switching topics, it's interesting to note that both Yerks and Andalites can take the form of other animals, but in completely different ways. The process of taking over a creature's mind isn't dissimilar to how it feels to morph, based on Esplin and Aldria's descriptions. The morphing technology copies DNA exactly, so a person transforms into an exact copy of a particular creature. 
For example, in Animorphs, Jake turns into a copy of his own dog, and Yerks slide into the skull through the ear, wrap themselves around the brain, and attach their nerves to the host's nerves exactly, until they no longer feel their tiny bodies. I began to wonder why Yerks don't use morphing technology more often, and realized there are two answers. One, morphing technology is still quite new. Only very privileged warriors have access to it. Aldria only managed to do it in secret when she happened to have the opportunity. The reason Espelin later becomes high-ranked Visser III is that he managed to capture Prince Alaran as a host body, and Alaran had the morphing technology at that point. And the second reason why Yerks don't do it is probably because it would be too dangerous. Yes, I'm sure there are some Yerks who would be happy to leave their slug bodies behind, just as taxons in a later Animorphs book choose to do, but you can only stay transformed for two hours before losing your original body's DNA, and the Yerks' goal is not to abandon their physical form completely. Though there are rebel Yerks who don't believe in enslaving other races, many Yerks are happy to control their hosts for a day before returning to the warmth of their pools. They don't want to permanently transform. As is, they can remain in a host body much, much longer than an Andalite can morph into another animal. Both sides have keen advantages. The Yerks seem happy enough as meat suit drivers. Kind of reminds me of that 1998 horror movie, The Faculty, wherein the teachers at a local high school are taken over by aliens. It did come out the same year as the Animorphs TV show, and a couple years after Animorphs first started being published, so there might have been some inspiration there. I was tempted to spend a lot of time going over the bits of Andalite, hork Bajir, and Yurk culture laid out in this book, but decided against it. Doing so would be a slippery slope into describing way too much about way too many books. Details about the grassy Andalite homeworld, how Yurks navigate their sulfurous tanks, the beauty of the cracked hork Bajir planet that reminds me of C.S. Lewis's Out of the Silent Planet. My favorite part of Animorphs has always been the aliens, which is why I think I love the extra novels so much more than the main series. I've reread the Andalite Chronicles and the hork Bajir Chronicles so many times. One day, I would really like to see some version of them turned into a movie or a TV show, maybe animated. But where to start? I'm not sure. These stories are prequels to Animorphs, so there isn't a proper ending without delving into those 54 volumes. The one thing I will mention is that the hork simple lives seem almost like a purposeful caricature of indigenous life as perceived by colonists. They work hard, tell stories by the campfire, care for their families, and live close to the earth. For a moment I wondered if this portrayal of an enslaved species might be construed as offensive or overly simplified, but I actually think that might be the point, or at least the point I'd like to take away from it. What does an intelligent race have to do to prove its worth? Do people need to be complicated to be considered worthy of autonomy and freedom? Do they have to prove their worth? The answer provided by the Animorphs series is a resounding no. Every species deserves a chance to live a good life. It's unfortunate that the Yurk ruling council took advantage of kindness, and it's tragic that the hork are so peaceful and good-hearted that they are easily overwhelmed by imperialism. They remind me of the Ents, tree herders, in The Lord of the Rings, who are happy in their forest until they are forced into war that threatens their existence. The hork deserve to live their lives in peace, regardless of whether uppity Andalites respect them or power-hungry Yurks covet them. This is true for humans, too, since the heroes of the Animorphs series fight not only on the battlefield, but also intellectually, convincing the universe they deserve a place in it. And that concludes the episode that may or may not be appropriate for kids, but is labeled as young adult. <laughs> Hopefully my warnings at the beginnings of these episodes have been sufficient. Like the YouTube video if you had a good time hearing about Dak, Aldria, and Esplin, and maybe subscribe, ring the bell, etc. Follow the Erica Brickley Instagram profile to see my library and what I'm up to. I post pictures of my vacations and troll dolls regardless of how many followers I lose. But don't worry, I always go back to posting vintage paperbacks. So, until next time, bye-bye, Earthlings.